Hello everyone, my name is Carl Mark Middleton. I am a PhD student at the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology, looking into various aspects of the southern ground hornbill species, with obviously their vocalizations being part of it. Just want to say that it's really great to be part of this conference again, and obviously I'm not there in person, but that is indeed a picture of me in the bottom left corner there. Before I continue, I just want to take a moment to thank everyone involved in the project. To my supervisors, Rita, Fanny, Chloe and Claire. Uh, to my assistant and fiancé, Carrie. Our funders, National Geographic and Fitzpatrick Institute. To all our donors and to all those who have helped with sightings along the way. Thanks, one and all. One thing all of us at this conference know is that communication is key and that it's vital for survival and reproduction. Throughout the animal kingdom, species often maintain and occupy territories which they will actively defend. They defend them since they secure access to crucial resources, things such as food and water, breeding and nesting sites, mates, as well as shelter. These territory owners will use communication, whether it's acoustic, visual or olfactory, to actually advertise and discourage intruders. And this communication between the individuals or the groups is often used to prevent physical defense, since physical defense can actually be costly and cause harm. It allows the individuals or the groups to actually assess whether the threat of intruder is serious or not. When looking at birds in particular, acoustic vocalizations are often used as their primary means to advertise and defend their territories. With this, the ability to recognize the vocalizations of others creates an advantage and provides the opportunity to save both time and energy. This has been studied in many bird species, which looked into whether individuals could recognize strangers from neighbors. What I mean by this is that if we had this target group, neighbors would be the birds that are just on the outside and that, and that birds that the target group is used to hearing, while the, neighbor, the strangers would be those unfamiliar further away birds. So many studies have looked at these and found something known as the deer enemy phenomenon, where individuals respond more aggressively to strangers since they pose a more serious threat. But while many of these have shown this effect on individual acoustic signaling, far fewer have shown the acoustic properties of group vocalizations in this neighbor versus stranger discrimination. A good study of the, where they did look into the group vocalizations is Radford's study on greenwood hoopoos. Southern ground hornbills are another great example of group living species. They are cooperative breeders, they are actually the largest cooperative breeding birds in the world, unfortunately listed as endangered within South Africa. Uh, the groups consist of about 2 to 12 individuals, with each of them having only a single female, followed by several male helpers. They, they live extremely long lives of 50 to 60 years in the wild, where they maintain, maintain these large territories of about 100 square kilometres. They're also relatively well known, in the bush at least, for their deep, booming vocalizations, which travel large distances. The reason why they are so well known is because these vocalizations are produced at dawn every day and are used as a means of long distance between group communication. <laughs> But, while they are well known, they have never been analysed in detail and little is known about who is contributing, what information they are conveying, how they are structurally organised and what the functions are. So the aim of my study is to analyse these individual and group calls to firstly see if they, get, they contain signatures which will support recognition and then lastly to see if they can actually recognise one another. The area where my research is based is in the APNR, in the northeastern part of South Africa. It's made up of five privately owned reserves that make up the Greater Kruger National Park. It's also the site of the FITS's long-term project on the species, which has spanned over the last 20 years. And so it's provided a wealth of information on nesting sites, group territories, group sizes, as well as ringed individuals in the area. If you look in the bottom left, you'll see a whole bunch of dots surrounded by polygons. The dots are nesting sites and the polygons are territories. So we have a pretty good idea of the different groups in the area along with their territories. A picture, say, a picture says a thousand words, and the picture on the right, you can see that the area has very distinct wet and dry seasons. 
and on the left you get an idea of the vegetation structure which is very bushy actually and so vocal communication is the best means of commu communication. So to record the birds we use two methods, active and passive recordings. For the active recordings we use the shotgun microphone during the incubation stage of breeding. Every dawn pretty much the birds will gather around the nest during this stage and provides an ideal time to record them. We've done this for 10 groups and each recording look, looked a little bit like this. So as you can see from this, while it is very beautiful, we can't actually ID, identify all the different individuals. So for example, we can't see which one is male and which one is female. So to account for this, the passive means of recording worked really well and allowed us to confirm our assumptions about the active recordings. This was done using camera traps, which took 20 second videos, and we've got six groups so far, which looked like this. <laughs> So unlike the active recordings, here we can actually see the individuals. Here we have the female, here we have an adult male, and here we have a juvenile. We could then compare this to the active recordings to see if they matched our assumptions in terms of who was actually calling. When analyzing the recordings, we looked at a number of frequency and temporal parameters. You can see here that there is a female sequence followed by a male sequence. So the first thing we measured was the actual duration of each of these sequences. We then looked at within these sequences, they are actually made up of several syllables. So we measured the duration of these syllables along with the frequencies. And then finally, the last measurement which we did was the intersyllable duration. The first thing we looked at was if there were any differences between males and females, since this might provide more information on the group composition as well as who is calling. The graph on the left shows the fundamental frequencies of each syllable associated around the means between each sex. The pink being the female and the turquoise being the males. You can see here that the females have a higher fundamental frequency than that of the males. The graph on the right is similar, except it shows the syllable durations around the means. This one, however, shows less of a difference. But when we're looking at a discrimination analysis, the y-axis here now has the fundamental frequency and the x-axis has the duration. We can see a clear divide between the sexes with a 92% accuracy. We then thought to ourselves, okay, within each of these groups, there is a single adult female. So distinguishing her call would be a group signature, actually. So we investigated this, and this graph looks a little bit unusual. But on the y-axis, we have fundamental frequency, and the x-axis, we have time. We also have all these different colors, and the different colors actually correspond to the different syllables within the call. So the blue would be the first syllable, orange would be the second syllable, and all the rest that follow. But these colors also show more than that. They show, so the blue, for example, they show the syllable duration, the syllable fundamental frequency, and then the dotted lines between the colors show the intersyllable duration. And altogether, it actually shows the melodies of the female vocalizations. So this is a single female melody from one of our groups. And when we compare it to the female melodies of other groups, we can see that there are very, very noticeable differences between them. So what this shows is that females have their own melodies which can allow for not only individual recognition, but also group recognition. We then tested whether algorithms could automatically classify the group vocalizations. We did this using a confusion matrix by using training and test data. And by doing this, we got an accuracy of 89.15%. So this actually provides extra evidence of group signatures.
To test whether the birds can actually recognize these group signatures, we used a series of neighbor vs. stranger discrimination playback experiments. We did this by going at sunrise to the nesting sites and setting up our little camouflage tent along with our loudspeaker, which was about 200 meters from the nest, and we sat and waited for the birds to actually arrive. Once the birds arrived, we would then begin, exper begin the experiment and play either the neighbor or the stranger call to them for two minutes and observed how they responded. We noted who responded, how they responded, did they vocalize, did they actually approach, how long did it take them to respond, etc, etc. After the birds had left the area, which sometimes took a few hours, we left and returned four days later to do the other side of the experiment. So far, we have done seven groups and nearly all of them have res responded successfully, but we have more to do in the coming season. The next video I'm about to show you is actually shows you one of the responses we had by the groups and that it was quite aggressive. <laughs> Apart from our poor camera skills, it is quite the sight to witness. So, in conclusion, this study shows that different sexes have different signatures in the ground hornbill species, and that females produce their own unique melodies. It also represents the first step in understanding how cooperating individuals contribute towards group vocalizations, and how this communication is important in their territory defense and survival. Thanks to all of you for, for listening. Um, I hope the conference has been great. And if you do have any questions or want to talk to me about anything, please feel free to contact me with my email address on screen. Thanks.